This presentation is brought to you by the friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. There are some difficult days ahead. I believe there's going to be a tribulation. See, I believe the Lord is coming. I believe we'll be caught up. Does God save His people from trouble or through it? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. People know that something unusual is happening. 2010, the Pew Research Group uh, did a survey. And in that survey, they explained that um, by the year 2050, 50, about 60% of the people believed that Jesus would come. I think 40 of those 60% were absolutely sure. 20% said probably. And that's in North America, of course. And that's why we're going to be talking tonight about the pinnacle of prophecy and signs of Jesus coming. You know, it's very interesting. We're going to be finding that the book of Daniel is a partner book for Revelation. So we'll be going back and forth. Revelation does a lot of referring to the book of Daniel. You look in Daniel chapter 12, and he says in verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So no question about what he's talking about. And he goes on to say, Many will run to and fro. Now, first of all, I think they're going to run to and fro through the word of God and discover truth. But you can't miss the point that people are running to and fro faster. You realize for about 6,000 years, people, the fastest thing you got is a horse? Just can't even imagine the change that's been seen. National Geographic back in 2006, I know it's an old article, but it still bears the point. That's the magazine cover. If you want to reference it, there's a quote in there. People are traveling far from home more than ever before in human history, and knowledge will increase. This is a picture here on the screen of the Great Hadron Accelerator. It is a, it's the largest experiment in the world. It's the biggest machine in the world. It's under the ground about 500 feet, a 17-mile tunnel in Geneva underneath the ground where the whole these European governments got together and they poured like $13 billion into building this testing equipment to understand physics and as they hyper-accelerate these particles, they smash them and then they measure what they find to try and figure out what is the base core of what life is made of. What is the stuff of life? They actually, the nickname is, it, the machine has been built to discover, they call it the God particle. Have you heard that before? They said it's going to try, we're trying to find the answers of where everything came from. That's a big investment. But with technology, not only from under the ground there in Geneva, but up in the sky with the International Space Station. Knowledge has increased. Just in, in one lifetime, or I should actually say in about a century, you look at just some of the changes, incredible inventions, automobiles, airplanes, radio, television, smartphone, computers. A lot of young people today, they can't imagine a world without a smartphone. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I get... Karen and I got a rental car and it's a fairly new one. We got lucky, got a low mileage rental car and, and I've nearly wrecked three times trying to figure out how to run the thing. I sat in the car when we got there and I sat there and said, oh, this is great, low mileage, you know, and I, I figured out finally you don't have to use a key, you just press the button because it knows the key's in my pocket. I kept trying to figure out where do I put the key. I'm one of these old people, I want to put the key in somewhere. And I keep taking the key out when I walk up to the car but it doesn't need the key, it just opens by itself and I said, what a waste of energy, I had to find it. And I'm trying to figure out how to shift the thing and I'm looking at all this and finally Karen reaches over, she turns a knob. Is it like a volume? You shift gears with a volume button. I'm a man, I want to grab something and hear it clunk, you know? When, she says, turn a little knob. So it bothers me. <laughs> Just things have changed. Can you imagine trying to explain a smartphone to the Apostle Paul? <laughs> he would think you're demon possessed. Paul would say, look, let me find that in my scroll. Say, no problem, Paul, I'll Google it. What? <laughs> Just, <laughs> Things have changed. And another one for me that I think is a tremendous evidence of the nearness of Christ's coming 
is global evangelization. Matthew 24, verse 14, this to me I think is one of the most powerful prophecies that really makes me believe we are living in the last days. Jesus said extremely clearly, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then he said, then the end will come. He didn't say it might come or it could come or it may come. He said very emphatically, the end will come. He did not say the gospel will be preached and there'll be a great global revival and everybody will believe. He said, for a witness, give them an opportunity. And then what they do with that opportunity is up to them, but the end will come. Well, is the gospel going in all the world? Just this last two days, we've had an invitation to return to China. Amazing Facts was very blessed. We were one of, if not the first Christian organization in over 50 years invited to preach publicly a whole series of meetings that was broadcast on television in China. And that was such a thrill. And uh, then the neat thing is, they made copies of that and they continued to multiply that. I just got a call from uh, our headquarters there and they said, can you come back? And so the gospel, and it's, it's now on satellite. Karen and I are going next month to New Guinea and they tell us there'll be uh, peop, about 100,000 people at this one meeting that we're going to in New Guinea. We're going to be in Australia. Uh, and I'm just one of thousands of missionaries that are out there doing it. It's not like we're doing it. Jesus said the gospel will go to the world. It's going to the Middle East. Amazing Facts gets email from all these people in the Middle East that are watching online. And so people are searching. And the gospel is going. And missionaries are going. And Jesus said, then the end will come. And so we're seeing, I think, the fulfillment of that in this generation. Now, I need to pause at this point and delve into a very important part of our study. I've been talking about signs of Christ coming. Now I want to talk about how he's coming. About what? How he's coming. Because there's a lot of confusion about how. Now, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that misunderstood how he's coming. Did the apostles misunderstand how the Messiah was coming the first time? Uh, they'll be in heaven, but they had the scriptures wrong. They thought when the Messiah came, he was going to come on a white horse like King David, and he was going to destroy all of the Romans like Samson or something, and, and they were going to be a world empire like Solomon, and and they just had all these great glorious ideas about when the Messiah comes and Jesus said no 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 that's when I come the second time first time I'm coming like a lamb second time I come like a lion well the devil's doing the same thing to the church today a lot of good people are confused about how he's coming so they won't be prepared to receive him a lot of Christ's people the Jews did not receive him when he came the first time because they said Nazareth who there's no prophet in Nazareth and poor carpenter, how can this can't be him? They misunderstood that he was coming first as a sacrifice. Well, now there's a lot of misunderstandings. There are principally three views. When you read Revelation, there's one group that's, they're called preterists. And just think of the word pre. They believe that all of Revelation was pretty much fulfilled by 100 AD. They think Nero is the Antichrist and that it's all behind us. Good people, I respectfully disagree. Then you have futurists. Futurists are the ones who have popularized the version, the left behind scenario, where most of Revelation chapter four, when John says, I heard a voice and a trumpet, that's all future. Then you have, where I fall in, what they call historists. And I'm in the company, this is, used to be the, the old view. It's not as popular as it used to be, but it's what the Protestant reformers believed. It means Revelation is covering a panorama of history from the first coming to the second coming. And you can kind of track the history of the church and God's people across that uh, horizon. And so I'll just tell you right now that you've got the two main views are the futurist view, there's not as many preterists, and the historic view. The futurist view is a fairly new view. It was really popularized by Hal Lindsey's book. I don't know if any of you remember a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And in that book he predicted that because Israel was established as a nation in 1948, in 1981 the secret rapture will take place, in 1988, seven years later after seven years of tribulation, Jesus will come and none of it happened. And he's still selling books. But um, it became very popular then. Uh, I am with the group that believes that the tribulation comes 
before Jesus comes. The other group believes that we are caught up before the tribulation. Now, I'd love to believe that, but I don't think it's what the Bible teaches. And we want to know, and I'm going to give you biblical scripture. If you disagree with me, then we can still love and respect each other, but you owe it to yourself to at least understand your brothers and sisters that may believe differently. Amen? And we can disagree and still be agreeable, right? Will Jesus come quietly? Let's look at what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and then it tells us, then the dead in Christ will rise. A trump. You read in Jeremiah 25, 30. It tells us, the Lord will roar from on high. He will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will mightily roar upon his habitation. He will give a shout. Jesus coming is a very loud event. You read in Psalm 50. If this was the only one, it would be pretty convincing. It says there, Our God shall come, and he will not keep silent. And it will be very tempestuous, stormy, round about him. It's a great climatic event. And someone might be thinking, Well, Pastor Doug, the Bible says he's coming like a thief. Doesn't that mean he's coming quietly? Well, I don't think so. Uh, you can read in the Bible where it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. What happens in the day that he comes like a thief? Notice, heavens pass away with great noise. There's a noise again. And the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So when Jesus comes as a thief, does it sound to you like life goes on here on earth? It's, he's coming like a thief. That just means it's a surprise. I don't know how much to tell you, but I've not always been a Christian. I used to be a thief. I would break into houses and steal. And right here in Florida, actually, because I used to live in Southern Florida. <laughs> not your neighborhood, so I don't owe you anything. <laughs> but um, I never sent out an announcement and said, I'll be coming, just want to let you know. It was a surprise. And so that's what Jesus is saying. It's going to surprise people, but when he comes, they're going to know. Now, who is going to see Christ when he returns? Is it only a select group that disappears? And listen to what it says. I'm going to give you several verses here. Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They're going to see him coming. Great power. Great glory means brilliance, splendor. And again, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Who will be with Jesus when he comes? He's not coming alone. The Bible says the Son of Man will come in his glory. That's that splendor. And how many? All the holy angels with him. Well, how many angels are there? Let's think about that for a minute. Most of us have a guardian angel. The Bible says... Jesus said, speaking of children, their angels do behold the face of my Father, implying that they've got an angel watching them. Seven billion people in the world. God's angels not only watch over people, they're doing His work. They're the ministering spirits. They're the army of God. They're called the heavenly host. Very real creatures with individual personality. Billions of them. Now, one angel came down from God. You read in the Old Testament in the days of King Hezekiah, the angel of the Lord went through the army of Syria. One angel killed 185,000 enemy soldiers in one day. The angels that were guarding the tomb of Jesus, I'm sorry, when the angels came to the tomb of Jesus at the resurrection, the Roman soldiers that were guarding the tomb were so frightened by the glory of that angel that came down and rolled away the stone, they fell over as though they were dead. One angel. Can you imagine the heaven being filled with the brilliance of, of billions of angels. He didn't say we're leaving any of them behind. He said all the angels. All the angels have been involved in our salvation. They're going to be very interested in us being redeemed and you'll see they play a part in uh, our being collected, so to speak. What will the brightness of the glory of the Lord's coming and all these angels do to those who are not ready? When Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And again, that was uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. You can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. 
and then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming the wicked ones destroyed by the brightness of his coming you know you ever seen when you're out in the field on a nice sunny day and you're just curious you pick up a stone and you turn it over and you see all these crawly things start running for the dark and at night you can light something out in the woods and all of the moths come to the light you got two kinds of bugs out there you got bugs like cockroaches that run from the light and you got moths and butterflies that love the light and that's the kind of people you got when Jesus comes you got your cockroaches and your butterflies <laughs> and so those that aren't ready, it's really if, if you don't have the Lord in your life you are going to be terrified by His coming but if you love the Lord the Bible calls His coming the blessed hope but if you've been living a life of selfishness and sin it's going to frighten you and it should God wants you to have peace but He doesn't want you to have peace if you're on your way to destruction He wants you to be troubled until you repent and come to Him the brightness of His coming will destroy them so what happens to the righteous who are um, dead at Jesus coming first we'll start with the righteous who are dead you read there the dead in Christ will rise first that's where we read in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout the voice of the archangel the trumpet of God someone once said that is the loudest verse in the Bible and the dead in Christ rise first so does that sound like a secret still at this point what happens to the living who are when the Lord comes uh, the living and the resurrected saints I should say so you've got the dead in Christ they rise some of us we hope to be alive when Jesus comes I'd like to if I can't avoid death it's like Woody Allen said one time I'm not afraid of death I just don't want to be there when it happens <laughs> so most of us are pre-wired by God that we'd like to stay alive right so what's going to happen to those who are alive it says the dead in Christ are raised incorruptible and those of us who are alive will be changed in a moment it tells us this corruptible will put on incorruption corruptible means our bodies we own, they get old they decay they die we're gonna get these glorified bodies like the kind Adam and Eve had before sin before the light went out this corruptible will, will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together what direction do we go that's when it's talking about the rapture we will be caught up or raptured up together with them in the clouds we meet the Lord in the air so Jesus feet don't touch the ground when he comes next time we meet him and Christ said this is how it would happen he said I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that's when we're caught up that where I am he takes us where back to heaven you may be also right we've read where it says the Lord's coming is literal personal, visible, audible, physical, vitality, vitalizing, glorious, climatic, there's an earthquake, every sense in your being will know when Jesus comes. You're not going to text someone and say, did you catch it? Catch what? Jesus came with all the angels yesterday. Did you? Uh, I missed it. I did notice some planes going down and cars careening off the road, but there was a clump of clothes in the bed next to me when I woke up. I think it was my spouse, but they're gone now. You know, I know I'm teasing, maybe I don't mean to be unkind, but to me, I actually know people who think, well, if I'm not ready when Jesus comes, no big deal. If my spouse, they're Christian, they believe, if they disappear, then I'll get serious. I might have to go through the tribulation, but then I'll know it's true. And you'd be surprised how many people out there are thinking they're going to get a second chance. That's why it's a very dangerous thing to not understand the how of His coming. Another reason is because the devil's got a lot of uh, impersonators out there. What solemn warning does Jesus give about the second coming? As you start reading Matthew 11, first thing he tells, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, first thing he says is, Beware that no one deceives you. He repeats it over and over. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. And I remember baptizing a young lady that was in Jonestown with Jim Jones. She escaped just before things all went sideways there and told horrible stories. He started out a Methodist preacher, good church, preaching from the Bible, and just, but he was a false prophet. See, it said ultimately he was Christ. Jesus said, there will arise false Christs. They will show signs and wonders. Are miracles signs and wonders the evidence of who's real and who's not? 
Can the devil do miracles? He can. We'll talk more about that. And they'll do this to deceive if it were possible to very elect. In other words, you need to know what the Bible says because the devil's going to have powerful deceptions in the last days. Some of us remember the Heaven's Gate group, Marshall Applewhite. 39 people believe this poor deranged man who said that he was a reincarnation of Christ and they needed to commit suicide so they could get on a spaceship that was behind the Hale-Bopp Comet. hale Comet. And they took this deadly cocktail. 39 people committed suicide. And he said God was sending messages through Star Trek. Well, there may have been a God sending messages, but it wasn't Jesus. What's going to prevent the righteous from being deceived in the last days? Isaiah 8.20, that's why we want you to know your Bibles. I hope you check on everything I'm saying. You take notes. The Bible says, to the law and the testimony, that's how the Bible refers to the Bible, the law and the prophets, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. You measure everything by the scriptures. You need to know. Jesus said, seek and you'll find. Amen? What will the wicked say when Jesus returns? and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, speaking of the lost, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I told you once again, two kinds of people. You have the ones who know Christ, and he's in their heart. You have those who have resisted him, and they've become his enemies. You've either got the love of God or the wrath of the Lamb. I want him to come as my Lord and my Savior, not as my adversary. Amen? Amen. What is the prime reason for Jesus' second coming? Is he coming to get even with the lost? No, he's coming to redeem his own. John 14, 3, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you might be. Where I am you might be. Revelation says God himself will be with us. We will see his face. Can you imagine that? Now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face. 1 Corinthians 13. What a privilege that we can see God face to face. You know friends, God is giving us the signs along the way. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, there are some difficult days ahead. I believe there's going to be a tribulation. See, I believe the Lord is coming. I believe we'll be caught up. But I believe the tribulation comes before the rapture. Does God save his people from trouble or through it? Did God save Noah from the flood or did he save him through the storm? Did God save Joseph from his trials or through them? How about Job? Was he saved from tribulation or through tribulation? Doesn't Paul say it is through much tribulation we will enter the kingdom of God? God is coming for a church without spot or wrinkle or any such things. You get out the spots and the wrinkle with a hot iron and hot water. So the idea that the church is not going to go through any kind of purging or purification before that, when does the church shine the brightest in the, in the light or in the darkness? There is going to be a time of great darkness. Jesus said it was at midnight the cry was given. Behold, the bridegroom comes. And so there are some difficult days ahead. I don't worry about that. You know why? God said, if you make the most high your habitation, you don't need to be afraid. Amen. He's given us signs. And some of Christians are losing hope right here on the borders of the greatest event in history. You know, I love history. I remember reading about uh, Christopher Columbus when he was crossing the ocean. You know, he just went launching out. And he said, we're going to go discover a new passage. None of the explorers from Portugal or Spain went very far into the Atlantic because they had rumors you're going to sail off the earth and there were dragons out there and, and all these scary stories. And he said, we're just going to sail west until we find our objective. And you know, after two months in August and September, those sailors were ready to mutiny. And Columbus, you can read his diary, he prayed a lot. He believed he was on a divine quest. He finally told his sailors, give me three more days. If we don't see land, we'll turn around. Can you imagine what was at stake? But as those days passed, they began to see signs. Overturned canoe went by. And they saw some coconuts flow by, some tufts of vegetation. Water began to change color. Saltiness changed in the water. They noticed when they were sounding that it was getting shallower. They songbirds came by. They couldn't see land, but they saw the signs that they were nearing shore. 
and they were all encouraged by the signs to press on finally at the end of the third day at night they saw a fire in the distance next morning they spotted land San Salvador well friends we see the signs Jesus is about to come I want to be ready how about you did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham okay maybe he wasn't in the room but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo from the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. he had a pretty hard landing, but he was able to swim until he was rescued. Louis Galdi dedicated the remaining eyes when you see and behold the destruction of the wicked. He can protect you and resurrect you. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.